All righty, we're back. Thank you again for joining us. And uh, so we're done with the presentations, so we can move on to uh, our deliber de deliberations. Who'd like to start? I thought you had a question for the staff. Oh, Commissioner, did you have a question for staff, Commissioner Anderson? Well, just to um, restate my question before about whether DTSC or the Regional Water Quality Control Board ever rejects um, a site as suitable for an intended use. Uh, I understood a, a large portion of your answer is about the remediation process, um, but I don't know if there's any con conclusion if the data is maybe just not available uh, as to like you know what proportion of the time do they accept the site as suitable and what proportion of the time might they just say, well, no, we, we can't bring this site into compliance? Well, I, I've been doing this type of work for over 20 years in the, in the state of California, and I do not have the experience where either DTSC or the Water Board has said it's not achievable or we just can't develop that site the way that that it has been uh, proposed. So either the remedial goal has been met or there have been mitigation measures or there are extenuating factors. For example, when we were talking about excavating soil, I was involved in a project where we were excavating soil because there were metals in the soil, and we literally went down 45 feet, and we got the sidewalls of the excavation clean. They, they met the cleanup goals, and we got half of the bottom, but we couldn't get the other half. And it, at that point, who is going to be exposed to that concentration at 45 feet below ground surface of a metal? Nobody. So, you know, the regulatory agencies agreed that we had done what was achievable and clean import was brought into the property and the development proceeded. So, so do you think unsuitable sites were self-selected out of the process or do you just think there aren't any sites that can't be remediated? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I think the, the risk assessment approach really is a good determination of what is achievable on the property. The, the, because the risk assessment approach provides risk-based cleanup goals. Um, it, Lloyd had talked about even if it was the intended use was going to be commercial. Um, regulators like to see the residential um, risk assessment so that they can gauge, you know, what the level of contamination is on the property. They also like to see the residential approach so that you don't have to have a land use covenant attached to the property. Um, so the residential risk assessment approach is very, very conservative, and I think that for those properties where the risk assessment and the risk-based cleanup goals are geared toward a residential approach, it becomes very clear whether or not that's going to be a suitable use for the property given the concentrations of the constituents that are on the property. So, so. I guess the answer to your question is, I, I don't know that it self-selects, but I think that the process, going through the risk assessment process, can help uh, make the best determination for the future land use of the property. So you said you've been involved in this process for 20 years. Uh, this process? Oh, yeah, the, the process of, yeah. of like redevelopment of Brownfields properties. Right. Yes. Yes, exactly. And um, have you seen properties similar to this? And have you s seen them, you know, finish 
Like, are there, are there properties that are 20 years old now that have been successfully remediated? And uh, are you aware of, you know, what proportion of those have post-completion problems and how those problems are addressed? Um, yes. So the, um, there are several landfills that have gone through the development process. The uh, development process for a landfill dictates that there will be long-term monitoring. Um, and so the, the failure rate of those development projects is, to my knowledge, um, not something that occurs because there is long-term monitoring of those projects. There are, are um, monitoring wells, there's monitoring probes, there's consultants that go out and record the information. The regulatory agencies are still involved from a monitoring aspect. Then there are those projects where um, I've been involved in and that they were remediated in 1999, 2000. There have been no problems with those projects. Those projects, um, although smaller in scale than this one, had the similar constituents. Um, so the I am, I am unaware of any failure of a redevelopment project of a brownfield site. Any other comments on that end? I actually have another question. And this is about, so if we make recommendations on one part of a project and it, it goes to the city council and the project is approved, can they take out one part of the project um, and have it and, and change it? or say no to it at a later, so say, you know, say if we approve, if we put in housing and it goes to vote. Um, what I want to know is, would the whole project go down if people said no vote, you know, if it got that far and, and people said, you know, uh, the city council wanted housing and then we put together the whole plan for the project. Would the whole plan be voted on? Would the whole project go down if people said, no, we don't want housing? Or, or, and then it would have to be sent back to UPC? How would that happen? How, mm -hmm. how is, how, what's the steps? Uh, that's a really good question. And I think what's going to drive that answer is what the city council would choose to put on the ballot. They could put a very specific land use driven question, you know, on housing, for example. That could be the focus of the question. They could put something that's a little broader. Uh, so it really depend on what question, you know, the council were to put something on a ballot, what it is the question is. Um, if it's, you know, do you approve this plan, yes or no? And the answer is no, and, and the entire plan was on the ballot, well, and then someone would have to be starting from, from a, a, a different point. But, you know, it would be up to the council to structure what exactly it is they want to put on the ballot as a question. Mm. And council can, uh, can also put on the ballot uh, other than the developer's plan, for example, the community plan, Crable. Absolutely. They don't have to put a plan on the ballot at all. They could... They could put policy language to be voted on. It's, you know, that there's no, it would be up to the council to decide what the question is that they want to ask or in what form they want to ask it. Um, I just wanted to add some <laughs> general comments um, related to what Commissioner Anderson brought up. Um, I think 
you know, having words like achievable and suitable are a little bit scary, if you will, um, for us, you know, when it, it, cause it sounds like there's, there's always a way to remediate an unsafe site. I mean, that's kind of the general feeling. I think we're feeling, we're kind of looking for solid and, and obviously you have a lot of information and experience and is, is trying to figure out what questions to ask to, to build, um, some more confidence in that area. Um, I had some concerns like with the assessment, you, you mentioned that when the third parties are doing the assessments, you know, for the agencies there, and then they respond to criteria the agencies put in front of them. Well, what is there other information that's not included, for instance, in that report, um, that is done in the assessment that isn't, um, actually provided because it's not checking off a box. You know, that was kind of one I, question I had. Um, and what was the other one? I had one other, you know, if monitoring fails, there, I mean, there hasn't really been, it sounds like any evidence of that, but, um, you know, if, if monitoring fails, what happens, what's the process in terms of liability? Um, I think that's a concern. We feel responsible by making our, and we will, when we make our recommendation, I think we're all trying to find some ground in that area. So I don't know if you could respond to that, please. Um, if I can ask a clarifying question, when you're talking about the assessments, are you talking about like a phase one assessment or a risk oh, the assessment? The health risk assessments up front? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the question then is, um, so the health risk assessment gets submitted to a regulatory agency and they review it and, and they redo the calculations. They make sure, um, you know, again, I've been doing human health risk assessments for over 20 years. I have mm -hmm. yet to submit one where the regulatory agency goes, yay, um, and mm -hmm. sends me a letter that says, good to go. They always come back with comments. I mean, you know, and I can agonize over the language I'm using, mm -hmm. the calculations I'm doing. I can think, yep, this time I've got everything. They will not have a comment. And they always have comments. They want to be sure because of their responsibility. Right. Just as you indicated, you wanted to be sure for your responsibility. Because at the end of the day, they are signing off on something that will dictate the remediation based on a future land use of property that was contaminated. And so that's really the reason for the inherent conservative nature of risk assessments. So it's, it's multiple variables. You know, it's multiple tables of variables that I'm presenting that are referenced that they check off the equations, again, that I'm referencing, that I present to them, that they check off, that then they redo all of the arithmetic to see if they are coming out with the same information that I'm coming out with that I'm basing my decision on. Um, so, and then it gets reviewed in-house. So before they send their comment letter, another risk assessor in that office is reviewing what the primary reviewer did. So basically it's going, I mean, I do calculations and then it's being redone by two other individuals mm -hmm. who are then either agreeing with me or disagreeing with me. And then it's trying to make sure that at the end of the day, there's a document that is rigorous, that is conservative, <coughs> that is protective of human health and the environment. I don't know if that answers yeah, your question. That, that helps. Okay. <clears throat> and I forgot what the second one was. Oh, liability if if something fails you know, down the road. Well, you asked about, about the monitoring. You know, um, it, there's redundancies built into the monitoring as well. Um, methane mitigation systems are, again, uh, a belt and suspenders kind of an approach because of... Um, methane seeking the path of least resistance. So you want to keep it out of a structure. And there will be uh, gravel beds, horizontal pipings running through the gravel beds. Um, they're slotted. So the concept is that the methane will uh, preferentially go through gravel into the horizontal 
piping run that will then go up to a vertical vent pipe riser that will terminate, you know, uh, eight feet from the roof line. Um, and that, that uh, between the gravel bed and sub slab, there is an impermeable membrane. And that uh, the plans are designed by specialists. They're checked by planning staff or the third-party consultant that planning staff hires. Um, monitoring wells are, are placed, again, by professionals. And the, so the information is always double-checked by somebody else on the receiving end so that you can see if there are any fluctuations or anything that's um, different than what would be expected, an anomaly. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of landfill projects uh, in uh, Southern California, they actually install um, active alarms so that if for example, methane achieves a certain concentration inside the building, then alarms will go off so that individuals would vacate the building. Okay. Um, so that's a possibility. Okay, and, and that's, and thank you, that makes sense as far as the monitoring. And you know, I'm not trying to find a hole necessarily, but I was just curious of the, of the process, if there was some liability, you know, if there was an issue and some failure, negligence in, in doing any of these, you know, preventative or monitoring or whatever measures, what happens at that point? I don't know. I think I'm going to punt to the city attorney on that one. Um, because the, 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 the process itself, I mean, there's inspectors all the way through. For the impermeable membrane, they actually do smoke tests. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the impermeable membrane? Because I actually wanted to see a sample of one. Be uh, you know, there, there was a lot of question about um, roots being able to go through just about anything. Uh, the impermeable membranes can be something like um, uh, liquid boot, which is a spray on. It's a very sticky um, uh, black material, sort of looks asphaltic. Uh, roots cannot penetrate that. Um, then there are uh, uh, visqueen, you know, of various thickness, black plastic liners that are typically used for landfill liners. That can be applied as an impermeable membrane as well. And There's those a, liners are how thick? Uh, we're talking about six mil thickness. So they're, they're very thick. The intent is that it's going to stick, and, you, and then you put sand on top of them. Uh -huh. So you have, you have um, anywhere between two to six inches of gravel. You have horizontal piping that runs through the gravel. You have your six mil thickness of impermeable membrane on top of the gravel. You have sand on top of that. You, everything is tested by inspectors to make sure that there's no holes. So they preferentially design this so that if you have um, utilities, that they're coming up at spaces where you're not puncturing the liner. They put the sand on top of the impermeable membrane so that there will be no punctures while there's construction going on. And then you have your pour of your slab on, on top of the sand, which is on top of the membrane. So the, so the whole thickness um, can be close to a foot of this mitigation system that you have sub-slab. So that's the top foot right by the slab is where all of that stuff is. Correct. Yeah. So if there was a failure of the impermeable membrane, then you could hypothetically cut it out? Uh, there have been instances where houses have been retrofitted. So a house has been in place, and there have been detectable concentrations of methane in the house. And then there has been liquid boot, which has been injected sub-slab of that house to basically seal the, the bottom slab from the ground underneath of the house. So there could be a retrofit example that could be used for anything that, that potentially uh, 
was penetrated where then there were concentrations of methane that were detected inside of a building if a building was constructed on top of or near the landfill. So when they talk about um, going out and checking the impermeable membrane, how how is that done? Is that by checking to see if there's methane or? Uh, um, it, it, you know, it's, um, post development. Yeah, apparently, you know, it's like f every year, every five years, or uh, how is that done? Do you that, know? That, yeah, that's through the vapor monitoring wells that are installed, and then it would be from taking concentration readings and in interior to the building. But the the monitoring wells that are installed are installed at exterior of the building, and they would. Um, you know, it's usually a two-inch diameter PVC pipe that has been installed to some level. It's a two-inch, did you say? Diameter. Okay. And then um, a field instrument would be used to determine if there are detectable concentrations of methane mm -hmm. at the surface, and a sample of air from the subsurface can be collected in a bag and sent to a lab that would also determine if there were detectable concentrations of methane from that monitoring well, that vapor well. But that vapor well is not on the interior of the building, it's on the exterior of the building. So that's measuring the concentrations of methane that are exterior to the building, not inside the building. And so if you wanted to, to determine if there were concentrations of methane inside the building, then you could take interior samples. But if the building has an active alarm system, then that alarm system would be activated if concentrations were at a, a level that was, deter it's a 50% of the lower explosive limit, which would determine that there was the potential for, for a risk. And I, I just want to remind the commission that the discussion tonight is focused on the residential question. I, I understand, yeah. but, um, <laughs> you know, we have to decide, and yeah, it, I, I don't want us to feel insecure. Right. I, but, I really need to know these things. The reason I, I, I'm focusing on the residential is the residential uses would be within OU1 and OU2 rather than landfill. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, okay. That's true. I, I actually have a question about that. Uh, cause earlier, Dr. Marin said that, you know, within a radius of a landfill, certain lands are affected. And I'm wondering, you know, what is that radius and was that already taken into account when the boundaries for OU1 and OU2 were drawn or is that something that's going to be determined during the risk-based assessment? That is whether there are portions of OU1 and OU2 affected by the landfill. Mm -hmm. Uh, to my to my knowledge, that has not been determined. A methane assessment would be would be something that I would recommend if I were working on the project. And so, basically, a methane assessment would be done on those properties to determine if there were any concentrations of methane on the property's subsurface that could potentially migrate into the proposed buildings. I wasn't thinking so much of of landfill so much as I was thinking of of liquefaction, you know, which kind of would cause the land to subside or... Um, and for, you know, just understanding the membrane. I, I think what she's trying to figure it out is in case of a seismic event, right. a liquefaction occurs and what will happen to the membrane. And uh, if, there's also, a membrane. All, if there is a membrane and uh, also, there would be subsidence as a result of that, and how how much tolerance you will have, and depending on the 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 depth of the liquefaction layer, and are there, are there any going to be any monitoring alarms in case of a seismic event that can uh, trigger that so that the so the residents can get out of that area in case that uh, leak does happen. So. Are they, these will be answered later on, or we can, you, we can ask you right now? Um, well, we have someone who can ask. <laughs> <laughs> so Who's that? <laughs> we, we actually have someone here we can ask. 
So hy hypothetically then, um, assuming that there's a um, methane mitigation system sub slab of buildings under at, constructed at OU1 and OU2. Right. Okay. So uh, liquefaction, my understanding is that that would occur from unconsolidated fill. No, not unconsolidated. There's a whole history behind that. There, it has to be a sandy soil and like a quicksand. If you go on the beach, when you put your feet, you go inside. So it has to be a right combination of this of the soil that, conditions. Right. So, so this isn't. Yeah, yeah, the maps show all of OU1 and OU2 right. are subject to high liquefaction. That's I'm sure I that the landfill is also yeah, is more right. subject, right. but the OU1 and OU2 and are not the, immune. And also the layer of the that soil will determine also if it's a very large, you know, very deep layer then you will ex expect the subsidence to be much hi uh, higher than if it's a thin layer. Uh, and th as a result of that, you will get, see all these bumps and all that, mm -hmm. and how much of that can those, those uh, things can tolerate. Uh, the geotechnical engineer who came here, he said that they're going to have a 10 feet of soil on top of that. But what you're describing is different than what he said. You're saying that there's going to be that impervious layer and there'll be one foot of material on top of that. But he was talking about putting almost 10, 15 feet of soil on top of that. Right. But even if you put 10, 15 feet of soil, in, in case of a liquefaction, it's still going to go down. And you can well, still have the subsidence. Thinking. So that so, has to be answered somehow. So from the... Uh, Geotechnical engineer's perspective, that would be the correct expertise to address yeah. liquefaction. So if the geotechnical engineer indicated that there was fill, and I recall reading um, in one of the reports, um, I think it was from BFK, that uh, a lot of soil was going to have to be moved in order to achieve correct compaction that would be necessary from a geotechnical engineer's perspective so that they would sign off on the project prior to construction. So, you know, my assumption would be then that they would have worked to minimize liquefaction. And at this point, we don't know that there would be a methane mitigation system that would be required sub-slab of any buildings on OU1 or OU2. But hypothetically, if there were, then if there was a problem with the system and if monitoring was part of the system, the monitoring would indicate that. If there was an active alarm system, then the active alarm system would also um, indicate that. Well, we did ha that, that thing did happen in the city of Brisbane. <clears throat> One of the, I think it was the Hilton, uh, what's the name of that? Uh, it used to be a different name. Uh, that particular facility had that uh, scenario happen when the, the methane was to start leaking and some liquefaction happened as a result. They have to take the whole entire, lift the whole structure up. So in this particular case, it will be very important to figure it out up front, alarm systems and all of that, when it will be triggered and liquefaction and stuff. But those are all technical issues and I, I don't want to get into details with that, but those are really big concerns uh, and, and uh, looking at the <coughs> hazard, hazards of the particular chemicals or toxins is one thing, but how to control that is another thing. The, those two have to be very carefully matched together in order to make it safe. And uh, I'll give you the example of that MTBE that, that you mentioned. It was a big, uh, big fiasco on the part of the, the California EPA. Uh, they didn't discover that for a very lo long time until there were a lot of lawsuits and people were screaming about that. So those type of things create very uncertainty in everybody's mind as to whether we can really rely on those agencies or not. Mm -hmm. You know, because the, the whole idea is that we're going to have 4,400 homes here and we want to make sure that uh, they, whatever we do, we cover all the bases, you know. And we keep talking about this regular agency is going to do this, do this, do this, do this. But their track record is also we have to take into account. Uh, DDT was another example where they really goofed. You know, they, for a long time, they didn't 
understand that part. You know, as a result, there was a whole bunch of lawsuits were filed against the agencies and all that. So all of these questions that we are asking here is trying to create some kind of confidence in ourselves. Yeah. You know, as to whether these agencies, even though they are regulatory agencies like California PUC was a re regulatory agency, what, what happened to San Bruno Fire? So the, there is a little concern about trust, trust in the regulatory agencies, you know, and that's what or we're even, trying to. Even that's trusting what, the building process. Yeah, that, that's why we're trying to ask you all this series of questions, because the same thing is citizens will be also concerned. They wanted to know whether we really address these things, you know, and that's why we are, I keep asking these questions on over and over again, to build some kind of a confidence, and also if we do decide to go with that. Uh, probably we will have the serious recommendation about a third party, uh, you know, intervention in this particular case, you know, as to, so, and I think that's already mentioned here, that monitoring by the third party also. Correct, and that's, that's the, f I use the word framework twice, but that's the framework set up when you look at the sustainability framework, your general plan, and, and the EIR mitigation <coughs> measures, so that what you're describing, the issues and concerns, is as the applicant is doing their studies, as the regulatory agencies are reviewing, part of your comments are the things you're addressing right now. Your comments to the agencies and to the developer would be, we want to make sure as a community, uh -huh. both you know, yeah. formal city and, and public, that you have addressed not only remediation but what happens on this site that your remediation plans, your, and you're discussing a little bit of landfill closure, have addressed the geotechnical issues as well as the remediation issues, and you want to see yeah. them both together. And that's yeah. all part of what the frame, sustainability framework sets up with <laughs> your comments, uh, looking at that, that concept of how do we make sure that things work afterwards the sustainability framework and you know, thought ahead with, let's look at, as a community, setting up requirements for monitoring so that uh, they are there. You already doing that kind of thing, for example, requiring ongoing monitoring, for example, at Sierra Point, mm -hmm. where they're required to do the long-term monitoring, and one reason that you would have somebody else do the long-term monitoring is so you don't accept liability for, for the results. So all of those kinds of things become part of that process, part of that review, having your own consultants separate from the applicant's consultants, separate from the regulatory agency to advise you on your comments, your role, and how to condition projects, the actual site-specific development, or even starting with the specific plan and site-specific development so that the design issues are taken care of, and you've protected yourself, whatever the land uses are, as you go through your site-specific review process. Okay. Thank are you. we ready to start discussing housing? Or yes, I think to Lloyd's, Lloyd's point, we should jump yeah. <laughs> right into the housing. And, and um, if I could just start off by saying, I was wondering <clears throat> on this whole assessment idea, you know, has there been an assessment uh, the care, you know, the adverse effects on the character of a community, you know, that's that's one of the reasons why housing, you know, we have a difficult uh, time trying to accept housing is where there's a concern about that. And like, what is there other than perception as far as, um, you know, measuring character and it's in the ability of something like housing to change that? Yeah. And, and, Unlike what we were just talking about where there are <laughs> measurements and formulas and models and mathematical things, character of community, when all is said and done, is perception. How people live in a community, how it functions. Um, in some communities, they're just with the size of it. Um, so the considerations here are right now, I, I remember using the term urban in the EIR and getting lambasted for that term. <laughs> when I was just thinking, it's rural and urban. And, and you heard a lot of testimony that community character now is 
suburban in character, which is very different than what occurs immediately to the north, immediately to the south. I, I kind of think it more like a village. I mean, this you know, this is the city of Brisbane, but it's a village. It's Small has town. it has two different sections, and then also on Bayshore, but it it is cohesive within, you know, a, a mountain, basically. And so, if we put four thousand something houses uh, right by San Francisco, I think that the perception would be that that area is San Francisco. I don't see how we could it could even see itself as Brisbane, I, and that I don't even understand how it could happen, because you know I don't know about anyone else, but I just can't see that given what we are looking at, that that particular community is going to see itself as anything but San Francisco. It'll be new Brisbane. It will be old Brisbane. I I. I, I don't even see it that way. I see it as, as, you know, it's sitting right there at San Francisco. And um, how, would it, how would it be Brisbane? I just don't even understand that. Do you? Well, there was an interesting result from the Parkside economic study uh, where the economist for the Parkside plan said that the housing in the Baylands, if built, those people predominantly would not come mm -hmm. to Brisbane to shop in the proposed mixed-use buildings for Parkside plan. So, so I, th I think that these areas are going to be socially separate under any circumstance. I, I, I don't even see that they would identify them. So, I, you know, we, we s I, I live at the Ridge, but I know that the Ridge identifies itself as Brisbane. You know, it also, it, it, it may not come down here, but it identifies itself as Brisbane. But I just can't see that it, area identifying itself as Brisbane. It's just... Well, it would have a Brisbane address. So it would have a Brisbane be, address. It, it, it might be a different idea of what Brisbane is, but and, and the future. Right. And I, I just don't understand how it could meet that criteria of being Brisbane. Well, well, we will be like a gaslight district in San Diego, and the new one be, be the new San Diego. So... <laughs> I just, I there's see no way it you as can, a you, There's no way you can ma match But I those. see, I, you know, here's downtown uh, South San Francisco, which is downtown San Fr South San Francisco, which is this cute little area mm. of a few blocks. Right. And then there's South San Francisco. Who knows where it is? You know, part of it's over here, part of it's over there, part of it's over here. You know, what part is, and uh, the reason I know it's still South San Francisco is because Daly City changes every single one of its uh, street names. So, you know, if the name has changed to another name, then I know it's South San Francisco. I kind of think of Brisbane as being a village, you know, even though it's a city. And, and that's the appeal. You know, if we're up at the ridge, you know, people are walking around the ridge. You know, I think that can happen if we... If if this community in um, New Brisbane uh, could have that too, you know, people could walk around, you know, it could be a community, but I don't see it as being cohesive with Brisbane. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know about anyone else. I just can't see it. No, that, I mean, that's a good point. We brought that up in the sustainability framework, and connectivity was that, and I think, Lloyd, it was in your presentation too. How do you connect that development? to Brisbane, small town, village Brisbane, in order to, you know, create that community. Is, is that possible? I, I, I don't know. That's, that's part of the discussion. I just don't, I, I can't, I can't see it. But the other thing that really concerns me is that when you have 20% of the buildings being uh, low-cost housing, and no way to get equity out of the housing at all. Um, and housing being built the way housing is being built, and having lived in a condominium association up at the ridge where the places ended up looking like slums for years because we were trying to figure out how to pay for the renovations from bad buildings. And on top of that, it's in an area that has to be remediated for toxins, uh, I, 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 I'm just awestruck. You know, I, I just can't get myself around the idea. I mean, we, you have no idea what we lived through. I mean, you really don't because you were living down here. I mean, it was just 
we saw people not able to sell their homes. They couldn't, you know, because we had to go after the developer. And, you know, and then you put it on a toxic land on top of that. Uh, you know, uh, people uh, at Viewpoint did not actually have the, um, you know, it, it could be that it's not going to be condominiums, but uh, the chances are these will be condominiums. But uh, the Viewpoint did not have the board that Altamar had. Altamar had the board that um, had uh, people who were bankers, and, you know, and Viewpoint did not. And Viewpoint ended up doing things that, in, and in the end, everybody in in the homes, each person had to pay twenty to thirty or forty thousand um, dollars as a special assessment. Uh, so far, Altamar has not had to do that. But um, you know, I, I and then you put no way to get out equity out of the houses, and I just don't see it. I you know, I ca I can't wrap myself around the ideas of having low-cost housing in this kind of situation. I, I, you know, obviously it's being done all over the county and people are begging for it, but that's the other thing I, I just have such a problem with. Okay. You know, and legally, legally, we, people cannot, you know, if they move in, they buy the house, there's no equity, none. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> when they move, it's gonna be, end up staying as low-cost house, housing. So, so you're saying there's no way to get equity out of the housing because people don't have enough to, for a down payment? Legally. Legally, 20% of the housing is going to be low-cost housing. If we put it in a condominium situation where there's, um, you know, so much is dependent upon um, association fees, then there is no way no way at all to get equity out of the housing, legally. And that is something that I see as a real problem with the current laws. You know, you cannot move out, get equity out of your building. It, it, it stays. So, so you feel like they'll be trapped in a way? I, well, and then what would that lead to? Okay. You know, and, and we can't say, no, we're not going to have condominiums. So, uh, what, what are we going to have there? Mm -hmm. are, are you saying that the condominiums would never appreciate and people would not, not have equity? I don't understand your point. 20% of them won't. If it's low income? Yeah. I, I think there's a little more nuance to this issue than and we can certainly bring you back some more information about the sort of issues with, I guess you're talking about for sale, yeah. Deed restricted affordable housing. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. I don't want to get into a big discussion. I, I think there's some nuance to this whole idea of equity building and limitations on that, and that I, I don't want to sort of leave the commission with the impression that there's a there's no way that some equity cannot be sort of gained out of that. So we can bring back some more information like during the, when the financial plan is yeah. available, for example. Right. So so generally. I think I'm hearing too, as far as the character goes, if people feel like they don't have any options, which we can get into later as far as equity, that it would adversely affect the community. I think so. That, okay. Just want to. Anyone else? Well, I have a lot of concerns with the traffic and all the other issues, which I don't want to discuss at this point. I think towards the end, when we deliberate, at that point, I will discuss that at this point um, I'm not so, you know sure whether I will say we should have the housing or we shouldn't have the housing because there are a number of things that in my mind I still have not uh, determined okay. uh, first thing first and most important thing in my mind is uh, is uh, compliance with the with the general plan and uh, I am the firm believer that you have to have the general plan modified first before you go through anything else. And in order to modify that, it has to be done by the citizens, not by the planning commission, 
uh, maybe sir, maybe the city, city council can do it, but I don't think we should be able to do that. So that's the reservation I have, and I'm still working on that. So, and there are other things regarding the EIR that I have some concerns also, which I still okay. working on it. So at this point, I cannot say whether I'm for the housing or not for the housing, or what. So you're leaning towards the option to, to approve an EIR alternative, right, which I think that, that's, last, one, right? that's one thing, or right. also right. The, there are some deficiencies in the EIR. We should address that first before we go through that. Uh, maybe we need some more, more data, more analysis. And uh, there are some that are really, uh, there's no way we can uh, remediate that. So we, are we going to be willing to write the the um, you know, a statement of over overriding the concerns, uh, that kind of things uh, I'm still debating as to how to present that. Okay. Because like traffic, for example, there is no way we can fix that. Mm -hmm. There is no way because the Geneva extension is not going to do anything other than just improve the traffic a little bit on Bayshore. The big, big concern is Highway 101, and there is no way in the world we can extend that. So okay. those are the issues that I'm still battling with. And so at this point, I don't want to give any impression as to where I am or okay. at this point. Fair. I guess I want to give the impression that Fair I impression. And my impression is that I don't want housing. Okay. Um, I think that we can do really good things for the, with the, um, area that but i i'm just not for housing that's where i am okay. i and i also don't want to change the general plan okay i'd leave it to someone else you know punt it down the road but i think i should i want to keep that well it has to be done by the by the community input and it's a so totally different process that need to be done so i mentioned that over and over again Okay. That uh, general plan has to be done first before we really. Okay, thank you. Just to excuse, just to quickly clarify the general plan issue, um, the commission's role, um, according to state law, is to make a recommendation to the city council when a general plan amendment comes before it, and there is a general plan that's been put before you by the project applicant. So your role would be to make a recommendation, and then it's up to the city council whether or not to adopt that general plan amendment. Right. Um, there, Just to be clear, there's no requirement for the community to adopt the general plan, except to the extent that, obviously, the community has input into what the city council and the planning commission do, just to be clear. OK, thank you. Yeah, thanks for clarification. Commissioner Anderson? What are your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, not a lot of has been said during our deliberations about the need for housing, and I think that is because we all take it for granted that there is great need. We've heard a lot of testimony for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it goes without saying that, um, you know, Brisbane should grow in areas where it is appropriate to do so and at a rate that is sustain or I shouldn't I don't want to use the word sustainable uh, at this point in the conversation but uh, perhaps I should say um, affordable because there, there's a certain rate at which we could um, accept new housing and that's something we'll discuss at a later stage mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the suitability of the Baylands um, I still have um, some remaining concerns about whether this is a suitable site for housing. Um, one of my main concerns tonight, uh, prior to tonight, was you know, in the event that something could go wrong, it, it didn't seem like all of the, the plans were necessarily repairable. Um, but on that point, I, I found Dr. Mirren's comments ab about the ability to even retrofit houses with uh, you know, impermeable membranes to be encouraging mm -hmm. on Good. on that one point. Um, I also found it encouraging that there are apparently extant sites that have been around for a couple of decades um, without any issues. Um, but 
I would like to study those directly because uh, so far the extant sites that we've seen have only been like seven years old and I think that's insufficient. Um, so you know, while I'm encouraged to, to hear anecdotally that they exist, uh, I'd like to have more information about them before making a decision. Um, what else do we have here? And on, on the issue of liquefaction and earthquake um, dangers, I think this is also a primary concern since the entire site is um, you know, on the map for being at high risk for high liquefaction. Um, and at, at a past meeting, I suggested that we might compare the building codes for San Francisco Marina and other areas that are similar and, and see if we feel that uh, those areas have been adequately protected um, for future earthquakes. So those are my minimum criteria for considering whether the site might be suitable for housing. Um, you know, beyond that, we still have to discuss issues such as capacity and, mm -hmm. and character. Yes. There's one more thing I can add to the liquefaction is that this particular site is different from Marina in the respect that uh, it does have the changing water table all the time. Mm. Mm. Oh, yes. It's very close to, mm. the, to the yes. water. So that creates a, another element that uh, from the geotechnical point of view. So yeah, yeah. Happens. at this point, we don't really know what would happen if yeah. we had a large-scale water table adjustment from you know, below the construction, you know, a sea level rise or something happening in relation to the fact that, you know, this area was all in the bay and, and I don't really know whether there's, there's risk of seawater intrusion for one reason or another into the area. Um, you know, Love Canal was completely unremediated and it, mm -hmm. it seems disingenuous to even bring it up and yet the main problem we had there was because it was unremediated, it, it was possible for large volumes of water to come into the contaminated area and that was what really caused everything to come yeah. to the surface yes. and cause a lot of problems. Exactly. So, um, you know, it, it's been said from the beginning that controlling hydrology on the site is, is really key and it seems like we've had a lot of talk about controlling it from the top, uh, but I don't know that I understand really if it's, if, if it's been controlled or is controllable from the bottom. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, and just to hopefully <clears throat> end this part of the uh, deliberation is my camp's been uh, for a long time since I've been in the sustainability framework uh, subcommittee is is about the character and connecting the, and though I'm not completely uh, opposed to housing um, I still have some some strong feelings about the the ability to connect to OU1 and O2, and I haven't seen, uh, of course, a lot of um, solutions for that. Um, in the sustainability framework, we did spend a lot of time in trying to uh, encourage that type of development um, within the development with the owner. So I'm still gathering information on the suitability of the site overall um, because a lot of it is perception, but. Um, so right now, that's where I stand. Um, which is? Which is, I'm not opposed to housing at this point, but I have strong feelings about the inability to connect to OU1 and O2. Um, and if that, if at the end of all this, in conjunction with the suitability factor, um, if it doesn't pan out, then I will probably be opposed to housing at the end. So, is that good? If, yeah. Good, because we're on a time check. We've got just enough time to get the comments in. <laughs> so, um, all right. So at this point, our del deliberations are complete. And as a friendly reminder, uh, and I think you've all noted your time on these cards, um, that you know, p further public comment is not required. However, we've created this uh, spot in in the agenda to follow our deliberations. Uh, for tonight's business only. 
Um, and please note there are uh, there will be no debate or rebuttal in order to maintain the order and actually get out of here on time. Um, so if someone and also if someone covers your point, you're welcome to come up and state that you support that point as well. So in order, we've got eight speaker request forms. And um, can, can I begin? Okay. So number one, uh, Ben, Paul, come on down. <laughs> oh, thank you. Alex. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you. My name is Ben Paul, um, and I work for Cushman and Wakefield. I'm a commercial real estate broker, um, and I specialize in office buildings. Um, I've leased and sold over a million square feet in office buildings and R&D buildings in Brisbane alone. I represent, represent six million square feet of office buildings in San Mateo County. And I'm here, of course, to talk to you about residential and um, the need to have new office buildings, R&D buildings, lab buildings near residential from an office perspective. and. The story, there's many stories, but the main story I want to give you is that there's a very large, there's multiple large tenants that are in the marketplace uh, that would be very attracted to Brisbane for the location, primarily due to its public transportation location and, of course, the views and all the other attributes. But really, when you sit down and you talk to those users, right, and you present sites from Sacramento to San Diego, the first thing they ask you to show them is available residential that's nearby. Mm -hmm. It's critical for you to understand. Office users that are looking for office space are looking for residential that's nearby. So um, I, I just I can't stress that enough. Um, I hope you guys consider the importance of that um, as you go through the deliberations. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, Paula, come on down. Hi, I'm Paula Stinson. I'm the Interim Executive Director of HART, the Housing Endowment and Regional Trust of San Mateo County. We are a JPA and a nonprofit, and we're made up of 19 of the 20 cities in the county and the county to come together and raise money to put Pre, big pre-development loans in affordable housing developments and to do first-time homebuyer programs for people that are desperately trying to stay here in San Mateo County. Uh, half our board is public members and Cliff is a member of our board. Half are private members. We have two board of supervisors, uh, including Don Horsley, who's our chair. And we try to talk to the cities to build more housing because if everyone does it, we'll have more housing. Um, in the past 10 years, we've put $14 million into loans to do 982 affordable homes. Obviously, there's a lot more that's needed, but you start somewhere, and this is what HART does. And you don't need to hear from me that the housing crisis has reached epic proportions. Um, I'm going to give you one statistic, and then I'm going to tell you two stories. Um, in the previous housing element period, 2007 to 2014, there were 33,000 jobs created and 7,000 units of housing. Of those units, almost 70% you needed to make at least $150,000 or more to, apply, to afford, so not even a lot of low-income housing in the last seven years. You guys have an amazing chance with a piece of land. If you put 4,000 units of housing in, that would be awesome. Um, I'm not going to tell you about the need for low-income housing, because I think other people are going to talk to that. But we do a first-time homebuyer program for people. We lend up to five, $500,000 with 5% 5 down and no PMI. We've been doing this for, we've done about 65 loans since uh, 2009, and we do a lot of workshops uh, in the community college districts, in libraries, uh, reaching out to people that want to try to get their first home. And at $500,000, 
there is nothing for them to buy. There is nothing on the market. We probably pre-qualified 100 people last spring. We've helped seven of them buy condos in South City. We've actually helped some folks buy in Brisbane, but that was a couple of years ago. Um, when we have these workshops, we have 50 to 60 people show up from all walks of life. A lot of them are young people. Um, and there is nothing for them to buy at that price. Um, I'm going to tell you my own story because I would use one of these loans. I mean, I've worked for 10 years in the nonprofit world here in San Mateo County. My husband is a science teacher, a high school science teacher in South City. We've been renting in San Bruno for the last 10 years. Uh, our landlord is very kind. He has not raised the rent a lot, but they may sell the house this summer for probably about $920,000. That's it. This, this is not a place for normal people anymore. We're, we're out of here. Everyone, I get calls every day from people whose rent is going up, they're being evicted, or they're still living at home with their parents. And they're saying, we're going to have to leave. And we can't even, with a half million dollar loan program, very ad advantageous, there's nothing for them here. So you need affordable rental housing, but you need housing for just normal folks. Um, you have an opportunity with the Baylands to truly make a difference in this. If your city builds housing, and Redwood City builds housing, and San Mateo builds housing, there will be more housing. It's about doing the right thing and all working together. You have a chance here to be part of the housing solution by developing the Baylands with housing in it. And if you don't, all those jobs and no housing, you just add to the problem. So please build housing on the Baylands. Be happy to work with you on loan programs. I can assure you I'll have 10 people per unit to apply. And thank you for considering this. Thank you, Paula. Uh, Richard, come on down. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. My name is Richard Koenig, and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the members of the Sheet Metal Workers Union, Local 104. I am here to show full support uh, for the Baylands Project because our members would like to work and improve the community in which we live in. This project alone will generate hundreds of good-paying construction jobs to support our families, as well as provide an economic stimulus for Brisbane. Bay Area, the Bay Area is growing quickly and it has, become a hard uh, it has become hard to find a place to live for most families. The Baylands can, can become a beacon for those looking for a home or a place to work. This is an opportunity for Brisbane to become greater than it already is. Your decision will make a difference for Brisbane and our neighboring cities. We urge you to recommend an approval to the City Council. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Nadine, please come down. Thank you. Um, I'm Nadine Mackey. I represent the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. Um, we work with communities and their leaders to produce and preserve quality, affordable homes. Um, as everybody here knows, um, housing is a critical issue in our region. Um, in recent years, the communities in San Mateo County have added 55,000 new jobs, and in that same time period, only 2,100 new housing units have been constructed. Um, the imbalance in development is causing a growing number of our workforce to commute long distances, causing, an in causing increased congestion on our roads. Um, Low-income families are being hit the hardest. Um, they're forced to double up and choose between medication, housing, and food um, if they choose to stay in the county. Um, and the rising rents here are creating a, a tidal waves of displacement. Um, so when we talk about um, the character of a community, um, it is my perception at least that the character of a community, uh, um, 
the what threatens the character of a community more than the housing construction is displacement. Um, the 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 community is are, the people that live in communities are the ones that create its character and impact its character the most. Um, and when they're being displaced, that's a really great threat to the character of a community. Um, according to Zillow, the average rent in San Mateo County is now 39.77, and that's up 10% in the last year and almost double from 2011. Um, rents are higher now in San Mateo County than in San Francisco. Um, so approving, approving development in the Baylands without allow, allowing for housing construction would only exacerbate the problem. Um, we urge you to require housing on this development, um, on, this, on this property, and in addition to pass an impact fee to mitigate the development in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Chris uh, Collins. Good evening, Commissioners, and thank you very much. My name is Chris Collins. I'm a representative of the San Mateo County Plumbers, Pipe Fitters, and HVAC and Refrigeration Service Union, Local 467. Thank you for this opportunity to express my support and the support of over 1,200 members of Local 467 for the Bayland Sustainable Community. It goes without saying that there is a great need for middle-class jobs to sustain local economies, but projects like Baylands, of which there are very few worldwide, provide more than long-term construction jobs, more than an ecologically sound plan that gives back to the community, more than much needed housing and protected open space and the opportunity for businesses to truly become a part of the community. By using skilled union craftsmen and women to build Baylands, this project, Universal Paragon, will be providing necessary support for building trades apprenticeship programs that train and teach to young apprentices the proper skills and work ethics that are the foundation of the building trades unions. Today's apprentices are essential to building the much needed sustainable communities of tomorrow. We have plenty of information workers in the Bay Area and many more flocking here every day. I speak to 20 somethings, high school graduates, every day who are searching instinctively it seems for honorable toil. They want to do more with their lives than sit in a dark room tapping at a keyboard all day. There are young people who want to work with their hands. They want to see tangible results from their efforts. And they want to be able to say to their children and their children's children, I built that. I can think of no better opportunity to promote the values, these values, than the Baylands Community Project. And I and my constituents, my members, urge you all to please continue the thorough process in a common goal to support the Bayland Sustainable Community. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. James, come on down. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is James Ragomez. I'm here representing the San Mateo County Building and Construction Trade Council. Our council is comprised of 22 affiliated local unions with over 16,000 highly skilled men and women in San Mateo County. This diverse workforce from San Mateo County, many of whom live in Brisbane, are proud of the work they have done and the work they are going to continue to do in this county. The jobs they, the jobs they have allow them to live in this county and provide for their families. They understand the critical need of moving forward with the Bayland site. By moving forward to, tonight, the Commission will be providing more good paying jobs with benefits for our members and their families. They will also clear a needed path for Brisbane and the Bay Area to continue adding the parts needed that make this region one of the most innovative places for, ide for ideas on the peninsula. There is a lot of pressure to build large campuses and headquarters for top Bay Area companies, but we need to act now if we want to catch this wave. The building trades are prepared to use their skills and talents to build residentials at market rate, workforce rate, and affordable rate housing, which is in demand by companies desiring a transit oriented location like the Baylands for their employees. 
The benefit of public transportation for a company's employees is also a benefit for the region's population and economy. The potential for revenue to the city of Brisbane and economic benefits and potential to raise the living standards of those on the peninsula is greater than any other project in recent memory. The building trades appreciate the work the Commission has done towards developing a plan that not only addresses the needs of their citizens, but also the needs of the surrounding region that this vast parcel of land offers. We support residential on this site. The trades stand by Universal Paragon to build our vision that your citizens will look upon with great pride. I agree with all the previous speakers, so I won't speak in statistics and of the need for housing, but there is a d dire need for housing, as you have already heard. Thank you for this forum. Thank you. Thank you, James. Novid. Good evening. Um, my name is Navid Safipour. Um, I spoke here before, but in case you forgot, I'm president of the Peninsula Young Democrats, um, and that covers uh, San Mateo County and Northern Santa Clara County. Uh, we members throughout the whole region and uh, our members are quite concerned about housing as a political issue even though it's not a partisan one um i did bring copies with me tonight of a housing resolution that we actually recently passed um and i was hoping that you guys might be able to take a look at that in your own time i'll um, maybe give some copies there uh, so they can be distributed um and it talks about the need uh, and the effects a lot of which we've heard already so i won't go into great details about the environmental the socioeconomic um, and also a variety of potential solutions, including corporate impact fees, uh, possibly rent stabilization ordinances to help people um, in law units. But, then, but ultimately, we need to increase housing supply to solve the housing crisis. Um, and so the point number one is in, for solutions is increasing housing supply overall, specifically high-density housing along public transit corridors. Um, there's sometimes a skepticism that increasing supply will uh, address housing. And I did want to mention that in recent months, the Legislative Analyst Office for the state did do a study um, which concluded that, yes, building market rate housing helps people at all levels of affordability. And that's something that we are seeing now in other cities too, like Denver, Seattle, and Washington, D.C., where they are building lots of housing. It is stabilizing or, in some cases, even lowering the rents for people at all levels. Um, so a contribution of 4000 would be huge, but honestly, any amount of housing will make a big difference. Um, for people like myself, um, I I don't make a ton of money compared to a lot of people in the area, actually. I work as a technical writer at a company in Burlingame, and um, if there isn't an increase in supply, the, the market rate rents for the region could go up beyond what I could afford. I have already currently paid more than 30% of my uh, income to uh, housing. And I have coworkers um, who, if there was a good amount of supply, would be able to live on this side of the bay, and that would reduce average commute times. And that was something I wanted to stress because I know there was some debate about, like, will this actually reduce average commute times for people? Absolutely, unquestionably, yes, it will um, for workers in the region. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention. Um, I wasn't originally planning to talk about community character and feel, but listening to your guys' comments tonight, um, I thought I should mention that I actually, so I grew up in the South Bay, um, in Saratoga, right on the border of Saratoga and San Jose. It's in this part of the city that is called Sunland Park that juts out into San Jose and is completely removed from the downtown area. I grew up thinking of myself still as being a part of Saratoga. I went to Saratoga Public Library for my books. I went downtown for coffee. I still thought, the, the perception was still there of me being as part of Saratoga, and I turned out fine, okay? <laughs> and uh. you know what, most of the people in Saratoga, you know, the, the house I lived in was more like the houses in San Jose, it wasn't a big mansion in the hills, it was in this, it felt more like San Jose, I still thought of Saratoga, and the people in the mansions of the hills still thought of their Saratoga as their own super wealthy place. So, building these houses, it I don't see it changing the character of the community, even if it is removed somewhat. I, from my own personal experience growing up in that situation. But more importantly, if you don't build those homes, then nobody is going to have access to any part of Brisbane ever. 
And that, I think, is a lot more damaging than the risk of possibly altering the character perception of Brisbane a little bit, maybe. So I think you have to prioritize there what's more important. And I think if you really evaluate it objectively, the reducing displacement in the region and in Brisbane itself is a much higher priority. And I encourage you to therefore uh, approve as much housing as possible uh, and not worry about the character of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Hart, come on down. Good evening, Honorable Commissioners. Thanks for uh, taking our comments tonight, uh, too. I'm Chris Hart from 223 Mariposa Street, uh, Brisbane. I realize this matter is one of the toughest decisions the residents and its leaders face. I, I'm here to say that uh, I support some housing on the Baylands. Uh, it's a transit-friendly area, and to deny, to deny people the opportunity to live next to transit violates every element of sustainability that I understand. I just learned of a 70-year-old family-run restaurant in San Francisco that is closing because it cannot retain workers because of the cost of housing or, or, or commuting. And th this is just one example, but uh, it is a Roosevelt's tell to your uh, tamale parlor in the admission. Wonderful place. 70 years in business, family owned. Uh, so, but here's the reality w w workers are forced into debt because of costly commutes or home prices, and f families aren't able to spend time together, and early childhood education suffers when children don't have their parents present to help them learn and grow. The Baylands has rail, bus, and trolley nearby to bring workers to jobs instead of the costly and polluting commutes. I also support business recreation uses following remediation on the Baylands, but to, not, but to deny housing is to deny a sustainable economy and lifestyle for our future. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for staying. Alvin, come on down. And, and you noted five minutes, but I hope you can keep it closer to three because we're running okay. short. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I am uh, Alvin Louie. I am a 16-year resident of Brisbane. I live on the ridge. Uh, I am completely for the housing development of those units over there. And my reasonings are, uh, when we develop over there, there's going to be all these buildings over there. It's essential that we have a community that is over there, that oversights that, 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 that land and the use of that land. We value the community in Brisbane. There should be a community that is developed over there. A community, people make a lifeblood of that community. The residents, they would oversee that development. They would use the transportation there. Uh, they would use the retail, the service, the commercial businesses there. And they would attract more people to the area with their family and friends. Uh, residents would work in the new businesses in the development. They would enjoy the recreational areas that will be created in the Baylands. An active community attracts businesses. Uh, residents make a community sustainable. And the residents that are living over there, they will be over there to uh, oversee that area, make sure that things are uh, safe and that whatever needs develop over there, they, they'll be the first one to correct because they live there. So in addition to all the housing there, it's, uh, it's important. I think one aspect that hasn't been really mentioned. Everybody talks about jobs, jobs, jobs. I'm a recently retired police officer, 34 years. So Thank when you. we look at all these jobs that need to be filled, they have to be filled by policemen, firemen, nurses, teachers, doctors, you name the profession. We're leaving these jobs every year. At least ten, tens of thousands in this area are retiring. We're living longer. The people that are leaving that are retired, I'm not leaving this area. And the most of the people that I live that, that have retired, they're not leaving. They've earned their keep and they want to enjoy where they're living. So all these jobs that we're looking at, they're replacement jobs. So when you look at the people that are going to be living in these housing, they're people that have to f fulfill all the needs of our community, the needs of the region. And so we, I don't know if people have addressed that, but that's one of the reasons that I, I think are very important to look at. And when we look at these developments, how they impact Brisbane, we know that there's so many other developments that have been built around this area. 
closer than the site that they proposed. That site that they proposed to build a housing is about three miles away. It's basically in another zip code. You can't even see it from Brisbane. And we've seen that all these, the housing over there on Carter Street, the Ridge, and, and the, the ones on the other side in South City, they really haven't Im impacted Brisbane that much that I could see. So, and you know, in my conversations when I ran for city council, I've talked to a lot of people on the Ridge and I've talked to a lot of people out in different communities and areas. And I have to say that most of the people that I've talked to they, they see the need for the housing, and very few even would even consider not having housing. They couldn't understand how we would deny housing to the region. So we need to consider the value of the housing in, that, in, 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 in the Baylands. When we look at these housing, we look at what kind of housings might be over there, mansions, condos, townhomes, or whatever they put over there. We know that whoever lives in those homes, they're going to love and take care of that home. They're going to love and take care of that neighborhood. I don't know anywhere in, in the world where people live, where they have a vested interest in, in their home that they don't care for. So we need to consider that also. Good. And I think when you and think second. about, okay, <laughs> just one thing, it, on the con connectivity, we know that whatever develops over there, it's going to be a completely brand new development. It's going to be a new viable neighborhood. It's going to be completely different than what old Brisbane is. It, but they're going to consider it as Brisbane. Just like when we moved into the Ridge, I'm a Brisbanian. They're going to be Brisbaneans. However it manifests itself out, that's to be seen. But I'm sure they're going to take good care of that land and that property. Thank you. Alex. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Alex Lansberg. I'm actually uh, a neighbor uh, in Baby Hunters Point. Uh, thank you all for for um, uh, deliberating this issue and talking about it, and 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 helping er all of us, including your neighbors, get a better sense of where you're all at on this. I, I wanted to address a couple things. Uh, first of all, um, as a neighbor of Brisbane, the way I've always perceived the city is one that um, uh, really had a sense of stewardship over the mountain over this little area. And I, I, I think that's shown here in these discussions. And I hope you take that perspective and actually broaden, broaden it to include your, uh, the sort of the area that you steward to also be the Bay Area uh, and our neighborhoods and the neighborhoods surrounding it. Because the fact of the matter is, if you're going to build 8 million square feet of commercial space, you are essentially going to, without housing, you are going to set off a displacement bomb in South City, in Daly City, in Crocker Amazon, in Baby Hunters Point, in all these surrounding neighborhoods that are, for the most part, at least north of you, low-income communities. And, um, a, a, and the types of jobs that are going to be developed in these 8 million square feet, you're going to have, uh, you know, just looking at the land use plan, you're going to have, obviously, a lot of uh, higher income uh, office uses, but you're going to have janitors. You're going to have people who staff this retail. Where are they going to live? That's really the question that, that uh, I'm asking you to ask yourselves and to incorporate into your ethic of stewardship for the land and for, and for the mountain. Uh, uh, moreover, in talking about community character, I think the uh, the the young lady from the affordable housing organization I think said it very well it, it's the people who make up a community and questions of urban design and 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 architecture that's part of what you do you can shape these things you can you can set up um, mitigation programs to make sure that uh, that there's adequate funding you can set up for example like what city of Roner Park did when a new sort of almost greenfield area was developed the maintenance annuity fund where they where as part of the the price of the development agreement was a chunk of change given to the city or written to the city that's basically the present value of the costs of maintaining that area. You can have Melarus districts to be able to, to fund all these things. We have so many different financing schemes that you can take care of these things. But what you can't do is drop 8 million square feet in in an area that is just screaming for housing, that's dying for housing. Uh, and 
uh, basically shrug your shoulders and say, well, you know, we like things the way they are. So I really strongly to, to think hard to, to pull all these values together uh, as you deliberate and look at this project as a whole, look at it as its impact on its neighbors, as well as what you can do for the future of the city long after you are not sitting in these chairs, long after you are not sitting on this planet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, take a time check. We've got two minutes, but I've got two more speaker cards. Are we okay with staying another 10 minutes? Sure. Yes. Is that okay? Make a motion. To uh, can I make a motion to extend the meeting for 10 to 15 minutes max? I think we have to do 15 minutes. Yes. I second that. Okay, great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, sorry, I can't read the name on this one. Uh, starts with a D. Debra. It is Debra. Oh, there you are. Okay. Should look further. Come on down, Deborah. <laughs> Are you a doctor? Okay. All right. No, but I feel like I should be a doctor <laughs> yes. after hearing all these problems yes. um, of our region. My name's Deb Horn, and I live here in Brisbane. And Alex, I love what you said. I I, I love the idea about stewardship, and I just want to um, mention a little bit about our history that maybe some of our visitors don't know about, and that is that I think of Brisbane as a little town that could because we saved a mountain from becoming a sea of condos, and that's San Bruno Mountain, the second largest biodiversity hotspot in the major metropolitan area right here in Brisbane. Um, and that's in the U.S. And, and so part of our character is that, and part of our village, is that we really care about people. We care about healthy spaces, healthy places. And um, I agree with a lot of the deliberations here that this land may not be suitable as a healthy space or a healthy place for people to live. Um, my gosh, we, we do have a lot of problems. We have housing shortages. We have, at times, job sh shortages. We have economic upturns, downturns, where we have too much housing, too little housing, too many jobs. Um, it makes me wonder why uh, we need to have more housing so that we can attract more business, we can have more jobs, and why don't those businesses go to Walnut Creek or Stockton or where the people are so they're not taking medication and so displaced. Um, but anyway, it makes me feel, listening to all of the problems of our region, a little claustrophobic, continuing to pile housing and jobs and housing and jobs on every little space of land we have. Um, here in Brisbane, I think we've, we've really tried hard. We've, we were awarded this year as one of the greenest cities in California. Um, so if I really think about you know, I'm hearing people saying, wow, this is an opportunity to solve the housing problem. I, I think this is maybe an opportunity to help solve the climate change problem. And, um, and that more, more cities in the region need to make contributions in that area to really protect our earth, not just pile on and um, take advantage and really destroy the natural resources that we have. So I, I love the idea of um, giving jobs to skilled craftspeople. We can build solar farms and wind farms. We can generate renewable energy. There's things that we can do with this land. There's things that we can do that will create some revenue. Um, is it suitable and safe and healthy? for people to live on? This is a really important question for the people of Brisbane who care about people. And that's part of our core values. Um, so, so the land is an opportunity. But I think we also need to maintain our core values. Thank you. Thank you. Joel, come on down. And we love you, but I'm I'm putting five minutes on you, Max. 
I'll keep it short. Good evening, Honorable Planning Commissioners. Joel Diaz. Um, yeah, so just wanted to, you know, talk uh, in generalities about the, the principles and the merits of the housing project. And, you know, um, uh, to touch on the union aspect of it, I think Brisbane is historically and traditionally a union town and very much appreciates the union. And so whatever happens should involve the unions, certainly. Um, Brisbane, you know, I feel is going to build housing. It's not a question of, of uh, if it's just a question of when, where, and how, and it has to be appropriate. So it, it is very much about doing the right thing. And so, you know, in principle, that's what we're looking at. And, um, you know, is this the best location? You know, potentially, no. You know, potentially, it, it is. But um, there are some, some big items of concern. And one in particular is, you know, the, the project has been presented in such a way that, and we're being sold the idea that this this housing is going to support the employees of the commercial development or the eight million square feet or whatever it is but as we know because of the phasing the housing is going to be built first and the and the commercial will come later if there's no guarantee when the commercial will come but that housing will be absorbed and used whether it's affordable housing market rate housing people will move in and use it and so once the commercial is built later on, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years later, um, that housing is already going to be full. So the, its intent um, uh, to be used to support that commercial um, development um, uh, it, it seems to be a false premise. So it's actually not going to happen. So we will have someday in the future, presumably 8 million square feet without housing to support it which means a lot of congestion and, you know, it's tragic. So that's not the intent. So we should make sure that that happens. So they, both developments should happen at the same time, you know, at least. Um, the other, the other um, thing that was brought up tonight was that the housing is actually a drain on our budget. It's, it's potentially a liability. And the reason to do it is because of all the revenue that the commercial development is going to bring us. But again, because of the phasing, you know, we could be, running deficits for a prolonged period of time. And because of the fragile state of our affairs, our financial affairs in the city of Brisbane, seems like a really unwise thing to do. Um, don't want to you know, start spending all this money without any guarantee of revenue coming in. And there is no guarantee. It could be decades. It could be never. We've learned from the Sierra Point development, which is um, sat largely vacant for 40 years that these these things are possible it could just sit there vacant for decades and we have to foot the bill um so that's that's a miss and it has largely to do with the phasing in terms of the the safety and the toxicity and those issues you know i get the principle that there are regulations in place that will allow us to achieve those regulatory requirements but that isn't the same thing as um, it being a good idea. Putting people in close proximity to a toxic landfill um, is not necessarily a good idea. Yes, there are regulatory um, abilities for us to potentially do so, but it, it doesn't equate being a good idea. And a, a simple analogy is the, is the fact that we know it's not good to pollute the planet, yet regula regulations allow us to pollute to drill, to frack, to do all these things. Yet, and we know it's not a good idea. So it could be a very similar thing, and I think we shouldn't conflate the issues. Just because the regulations may allow us to do this thing doesn't mean it's a good idea to put people in close proximity to a toxic dump, which was historically a dump for the city of San Francisco for decades, which is a giant metropolitan hub of the US. So thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Thank you for thank you for all contributing. This will be, we need to close this. Yes. So may we have a motion to uh, close public comments? I make a motion to close the public comments. I second it. I beat you. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, now we're moving on and items initiated by staff. I don't have anything to see. Okay. And the last item, any uh issue any items initiated by us do we have anyone else have an no. item to add no no okay all right can we have a motion to adjourn to our next regular meeting on uh march 24th go ahead, Carl. <laughs> go ahead. before i say it <laughs> i make a motion to adjourn to the next meeting of 
March 24th at 7.30 p.m. Is that the correct date? Yes. Yes. Right here. And I will not be there that night, so I hope everyone here since yeah. we'll need a quorum. And again, we can just clarify that March 24th will be regular business? Yeah, regular meeting. Regular, yes. right. Yes. Sorry. The Our next regular meeting. So yes. I second that. So. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so, again, I want to say Yeah. No, I won't be here. Oh, good. <coughs>